This is my video update from Moscow, Russia on this Monday afternoon, July the 17th. Let's talk about some news. And the big story, of course, is the early morning strike on the Kerch Bridge. The Ukraine military hit the Kerch Bridge at around 3, 3 a.m., 3.30. And this, uh, this actually was the second attempt that they made towards Crimea within a 24-hour period. Remember in my video yesterday from Yerevan, I had some breaking news towards the end of my video that the Ukraine military had launched a series of, uh, of drone strikes they were all repelled by the Russian military, but they launched a whole bunch of drones towards uh, Sevastopol in Crimea. And, uh, and later on in the day, early in the morning, they launched another attack towards the Kerch Bridge. And this, this one made it through. So this comes on the same day that the grain deal is up. It's, it's expired and it doesn't look like Russia is going to renew their part in the grain deal. Now, Russia doesn't have to leave the grain deal from what I understand. It just expires and they have the option of either letting it expire or renewing it. And the Kremlin spokesman Peskov, he came out with a statement today and he said that uh, Russia is not going to, to take part in the grain deal as it expires unless various conditions are met. And one of those conditions was that Ukraine stops uh, using the corridor from this grain deal, the uh, the Black Sea corridor, and they stop launching attacks towards uh, Crimea. That was one of the one of the major uh, points of contention that Russia has with this uh, with this grain deal. And after this strike on the Kerch Bridge, which, by the way, is the second uh, time that the Ukraine military has hit the Kerch Bridge. I'm very curious to see what Russia does with regards to this grain deal. I wonder if they're going to continue to to speak with the UN, to speak with Turkey and Erdogan and to say, look, we'll we'll take part in the grain deal now that it's expired. We'll uh, renew it. But Look, uh, look what just happened. The Aletsky regime attacked the Kerch Bridge again. And so we have to, uh, we have to see what we're going to do about that. I wonder if, if Russia is going to approach it that way or if Russia is going to say, you know, we're, we're done with this. We're, uh, we're pulling out of this grain deal. We're, well, we're not going to renew this grain deal because uh, the Ukraine military uses these corridors to, to hit at Crimea and... They did it the first time and you guys assured us that it would not happen again. Turkey, Erdogan, the collective West. And sure enough, it has happened again. So we're completely out. So I'm very curious to see what what happens now with the grain deal going forward. I'm positive that the collective West, they uh, they greenlit this attack on the Kerch Bridge. There are rumors saying that the U.S. was actually flying reconnaissance uh, uh, drones at the exact time that the the strike happened on the Kerch Bridge. So maybe the Collective West, maybe the United States was doing more than just green lighting this Ukraine attack on the Kerch Bridge. But either way, the, uh, the Collective West, they're going to use this expiration of the grain deal and Russia's refusal to, to renew it or possible refusal to renew the grain deal. They're going to use it as some really good propaganda. They're going to run all kinds of, uh, of stories and media campaigns saying that Russia has pulled out of the grain deal and Russia is starving the world and Russia is preventing food from, uh, from leaving Ukraine. And that's why we have hunger and that's why we have inflation. And they're going to run all kinds of stories like this without, uh, without reporting the the details as to why Russia has decided to not take part in a renewed grain deal. But no doubt the collective West is going to, if Russia doesn't uh, renew the deal, 
the collective West is going to use it against Russia in a big media campaign to say that Russia is starving the world and food prices and inflation are because Russia is preventing grain and wheat from leaving Ukraine. Another thing the collective West might do, now that I think about it, is they may actually try to go to countries that, uh, that were to benefit from the grain deal and that have been neutral in sanctioning Russia. And they might go to these countries and try to, to move them over to, to the collective West side of things by telling them, you see, Russia pulled out of the, the grain deal. Now, now your country is suffering and your country can't get the, the food that it needs from, from Ukraine. And so isn't it time that you moved over to our side and started sanctioning Russia? So I can see the collective West doing that as, uh, as well. So as far as the actual strike is concerned, the casualties are uh, two people, two parents actually uh, died in this uh, terrorist attack. And one, from, from what I read, one, uh, one very young child, I believe a young girl, was taken to the hospital and she's in critical condition. And I believe the, the two parents, the two parents were her parents that died in this, uh, in this attack. I've read that, uh, that the, the railway links are functioning, they're operational, they weren't damaged. But uh, from, from what I understand, I believe one or two lanes is, is not moving in, uh, on the Kerch Bridge. But I'm, I'm not quite sure about that. I do know that the, uh, the authorities are investigating the, the actual damage that is done and they're going to give their assessment as to, as to how bad uh, the damage was. There are gonna be those, uh, those analysts that are saying that the reason Ukraine hit this bridge again is because this is going to stop the supply of Russian weapons to the land corridor in uh, in Zaporozhye and Kherson, stuff like that. But Brian Berletic, he's he's made a bunch of videos and he's talked about how even in the worst case scenario, if you were to completely remove the Kerch Bridge, Russia has built all kinds of uh, conting contingencies to make sure that that supplies, whether uh, civilian or military can make their way in and out of, uh, of Crimea. They have ferries, uh, they have air transport. And so the whole, uh, the whole narrative that Ukraine has hit this, uh, this military, this important military uh, infrastructure of, uh, of the Russian Federation, it's not true. It's not true. Even in the worst case scenario, and you didn't have the Kerch Bridge, Russia would still be able to to supply whatever, whatever troops they needed to supply in the uh, Kherson and Zaporozhye regions. So I just wanted to, to mention that as well, because you have a lot of analysts saying this is a great victory for Ukraine. And now how is Russia going to supply their troops now that the Kerch Bridge is not functioning? This is a log logistical uh, nightmare for the Russian military. That's nonsense. It is just nonsense. And everyone is wondering to, speculating, not wondering, everyone is speculating to see what Russia is going to do in retaliation. And my thinking on this is that uh, you're gonna probably get the same retaliation that, uh, that happened after the first attack on the Kerch Bridge, which was what, six months ago? And, uh, and the Alensky regime, they even issued a postage stamp to commemorate the, the great victory of hitting the, the Kerch Bridge. And uh, 72 hours later, from that first strike on the Kerch Bridge, Russia launched what was at the time the largest missile strike towards uh, military infrastructure and energy infrastructure in, uh, in Ukraine. And so I imagine you're going to get the same response this time around. What you're probably going to see is you're going to probably see Russia hit uh, decision-making centers. They issued a warning three weeks ago and they said any attacks on the Russian Federation would mean that we would hit decision-making centers of, uh, of the Ukraine 
Command and the Collective West. Many of these centers are, are, uh, are joint command centers. You have NATO commanders as well as, uh, as Ukraine military and mercenaries at these facilities. And the Russian Ministry of Defense, they issued a statement three weeks ago and they said, we know where all your command centers are uh, in Ukraine and outside of Ukraine. But in Ukraine, they're like, we know where all these centers are. And if you attack our our territory, well, then we're just going to take out command centers. So you're going to probably probably see something like that uh, taking place. No doubt the, uh, the techniques of uh, NATO and uh, the Alensky regime are moving. They're evolving and moving more towards a type of, uh, of, of terrorist uh, operation, I would say. You're kind of looking at like an IS, a NATO-sponsored IS being formed in Ukraine, much like Obama was funding uh, IS in Syria. I think you're starting to see the beginnings of, of that come about in Ukraine. They're, they're going after journalists. They tried to, uh, to assassinate um, the editor-in-chief of RT just yesterday. They assassinated the submarine commander a couple of days ago. Now they hit the, uh, the Kerch Bridge. You're seeing an evolution towards, towards a type of, of NATO IS terrorist uh, operation in Ukraine forming. That's, that's what's happening. The more they lose the war, the more they start shifting their, their technique to, to something else, something more, more sinister. Uh, targeting civilians, targeting civilian infrastructure. I can definitely see see the uh, the Ukraine uh, regime and this NATO proxy moving in that direction as well. So, um, I'm trying to see if I have anything else to say about this Kerch Bridge strike. It doesn't change the the trajectory of the conflict whatsoever. Uh, as a matter of fact, Ukraine doing this actually worsens their position. If, if you ask me, they're going to get some command centers taken out. They're obviously using drones and missiles, which they have in short supply to, to do damage to a bridge, which the Russians will fix in, in 24 hours. They'll, 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 get, they'll, they'll definitely get the, 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 uh, the movement up and running again in, in 24 hours if they're going to actually fix the the part of the bridge that was damaged. It's going to take a little bit longer, but uh, whatever traffic exists, I'm sure that, uh, that the Russian government is going to fix that in the next 24 hours and things will be moving uh, back and forth uh, from Crimea and the Kerch Bridge. So what Ukraine gains is, is nothing really. For, for a couple of days now, they can issue another postage stamp and they can say how oh, this was a great victory. I believe uh, a Ukrainian parliament member put out a statement and said that this should show the collective West that, uh, that we can definitely win this conflict and that we can hit Russian territory when, when we want. And, and now the collective West is going to give us more money and more weapons because of this strike on the Kerch Bridge. That's just complete nonsense. On a military level, as far as the conflict is concerned, this does nothing. This actually hurts Ukraine's position. It's going to be used by the, uh, by the Biden White House, the collective West media, to, uh, to smear Russia if they don't renew the grain deal. That's exactly what they're going to use this incident for. That's my uh, take on it. Russia is starving the world. Your recession and your inflation is because Russia does not allow ships to leave the port of Odessa. That's exactly what uh, what they're going to run with in the collective West media. So shifting gears a bit, we had an interview that took place on Sunday before the strike on the Kerch Bridge with uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin and the journalist Pavel Zarubin. And Putin said a couple of interesting things in this interview. He said that uh, the Ukraine counteroffensive has seen no success in more than a month of, uh, of activity. Quote, all attempts by the enemy to breach our defenses, 
including through the use of strategic reserves, have fallen flat. Throughout the counteroffensive, our enemy remains unsuccessful. Putin also acknowledged that uh, the Russian military is indeed launching a counteroffensive, and they're advancing in certain areas of the front line. He said that uh, the Russian military, and I quote, is taking the most advantageous positions. And he also talked about the weapons that the Russian uh, military has captured in the first month and a half of the great big counteroffensive that offends me and offends you and offends everybody. And uh, Putin said that they're going to take these weapons and they're going to study them and see what makes all of these wonder weapons tick. So that was an interesting statement from the Russian president. Business Insider, they ran an article and they said that the Russian military has knocked out one third of Ukraine's Bradleys, U.S. Bradleys that were given to Ukraine. But if you use Annalena Baerbach logic, these aren't American Bradleys. These are now Ukraine Bradleys anyway. Business Insider confirmed what the New York Times reported on a couple of days ago as well, which is that the Russian military has taken out 20%, 30%, 40% of uh, the wonder weapons that the collective West had sent Ukraine in the beginning of this big counteroffensive. At least 34 Bradleys have now visually have now been visually confirmed as having been abandoned, damaged, or destroyed, Business Insider said, citing open source data from the military research firm Oryx. Business Insider says that the U.S. has supplied as many as 109 Bradley fighting vehicles. Now, I'm not so sure about this open source research company Oryx. I think uh, Alexander mentioned them in a video he did a couple of days ago that he's a little iffy on this uh, on this research firm and the open source data that that they use to come up with these these numbers. But this is what they're running with. 34 Bradleys confirmed destroyed out of 109 that were given by the U.S. And the Business Insider article also says what uh, what the New York Times article said, which is that a lot less vehicles are being destroyed, not because the Ukraine is is fighting better, but because they're just not sending the vehicles to the front line. And what Ukraine is now doing is that they're just sending men, like just pushing people to move across this, uh, this gray, gray zone area to try and reach the front lines of the fort fortifications, this highly mined area. And uh, instead of using vehicles, they're just pushing people to, to move through these mines. So that's why less vehicles are being destroyed. That's, uh, that's the Alensky regime for you. Let's, uh, let's go for a walk in a bit and we can talk about Crimea and we can do our clown world segment as well. So Newsweek, they ran an article on uh, Crimea with the title, Ukraine Mulls Crimea Conundrum. You cannot punish everyone. And in this article from Newsweek, they say that Ukraine will take a flexible approach in dealing with potential Russian collaborators in the planned liberation of Crimea, Kiev's representative for the occupied peninsula says, as officials plan for the potential reintegration of some 2 million people living in the area occupied by Moscow since 2014. Tamira Tasheva, who since April 2022 served as President Alensky's permanent representative from Crimea, told the Newsweek that Kiev expects to blacklist some 10,000 Ukrainians who have collaborated with Russian authorities, though will not punish those it deems victims of the occupation. So, Zaluzhny gave an interview to the New York, to the Washington Post, I was going to say the New York Post, to the Washington Post the other day, and he was talking about how he's going to 
take back Crimea at all costs, even if he had to use his own weapons. That's what Zeluzhny told the WAPO the other day. And now you have this article from Newsweek with Elensky's Crimea representative saying that she's already planning for the uh, liberation and reintegration of Crimea into Ukraine. And she's, uh, she's planning on blacklisting 10,000 Ukrainians and creating uh, courts and, and reintegration uh, juries and trials and stuff like that. And I read this Newsweek article and it's ridiculous, but I know why they're running with this. The one reason is so that they can keep everyone invested in the conflict and believing that, and when I mean everyone, the collective West as well as people in Ukraine, keep them invested in the conflict and believing that they're actually uh, winning and they can actually take Crimea back. So that's one of the reasons why they, they run articles like this. And another reason is because this, uh, this representative Tasheva, I believe Tasheva was her name. She uh, she wants to keep her job, <laughs> right? That's her job to uh, to plan for the reintegration of Crimea. That's what she's paid to do, and that's what her whole staff is paid to do, and. And all of the U.S. taxpayer money goes to her and her staff to plan the reintegration of Crimea. And so every so often, she has to give these interviews to Newsweek and talk about the work that she's doing to plan for the capturing of Crimea. <laughs> that's, that's why she does it. Basically, she just wants to make sure that she's going to be getting more U.S. taxpayer dollars. It's kind of like those, uh, the bureaucrats that sit in government that just put out reports after report after report to justify their position and to justify their salary, even though the reports are, are kind of useless or get thrown away. That's, that's what she's doing. This is the same... This is the same lady that, uh, that a couple of days ago said that she's going to turn Crimea into a cannabis hub. <laughs> yeah, she's got to justify her salary, so she's got to put out reports like this every so often. Make sure she gets some of that Collective West taxpayer money. So let's, uh, let's do a clown world couple of clown worlds and we'll wrap this video up beautiful Chisti Prudi if you come to Moscow this is definitely a place to to visit so let's work our way towards the actual pond hence the name Chisti Prudi clean pond my russian's coming back to me <laughs> um let's see clown world clown world annalena 360 bareback <laughs> she has given us another clown world and she gave an interview to germany's build publication and she is blaming the German recession and the cost of living crisis in Germany on the special military operation. In other words, it's Putin's fault. Russia did it. And she was asked to explain, Bill asked her to explain, why uh, German money is being sent to, uh, to the Alensky regime as German citizens are uh, are forced to cut back on expenses and 
Bild said that many German citizens are not even going to uh, be able to afford a holiday. And let me just step over right here and read you what Annalena 360 said to that question from Bild. She said, one has nothing to do with the other. It is not the military aid for Ukraine, which is weighing on Germans' pockets, but Russia's military operation. The Russian war of aggression is not only the cause of the catastrophic situation in Ukraine, but is also the reason why the world economy has gotten into another crisis after the coup. That hunger in the world has grown, that we are also in an economic recession in Europe, because we have made ourselves independent of Russian gas and oil. In other words, to all those who are now saying, do something about inflation, to them I reply, this is one of the reasons why this war must stop. Notice how Baerbach, in her reply to Bild, said that hunger in the world has grown. The special military operation is the cause for world hunger. And we go back to the grain deal and, and what I said earlier. She also, uh, what else did she said? She said that the fact that people don't have enough money to go on vacation hurts her as well. It hurts her as well. But urge people to be careful that we don't start to look away from what's happening in Ukraine when we're talking about vacations because this war hasn't left us untouched either. So to, to the citizens of Germany who have had to, to cut back on various expenses as they see the Schultz government sending billions and billions and billions and billions to the Alensky regime, Annalena Baerbach wants to know that, you know, it's hurting her as well. <laughs> she's she's also suffering on those private jets and lavish cocktail parties at at the EU headquarters and the NATO summits you know it's it's really uh hurting her uh pocketbook as well <laughs> I also like how in the statement she said that uh that the special military oper operation is the cause of of the recession and that's why this war must stop well, Annalena, stop the war. Tell Alensky to negotiate. I mean, she said it in her reply. That's why this war must stop. This is one of the reasons why the, the, this war must stop. That's a direct quote from this Bild interview. Well, you know, Germany was, uh, well, they were one of the, the parties of the Minsk agreement, weren't they? Minsk one and Minsk two. And... <laughs> And Germany didn't get the Alensky regime to, or the Poroshenko regime for that matter, to abide by the Minsk agreement, to enforce the Minsk agreement, did they? They did the exact opposite. As Angela Merkel said, they used the Minsk agreement to buy time. So Germany can, can use, uh, use its influence in Europe to say stop, let's stop sending money, let's stop sending weapons, and then the war stops. But if, uh, if Germany did that, we'd probably have like another Nord Stream incident, wouldn't we? Because one of the reasons, one of the alleged reasons as to, as to why Biden and Newland blew up Nord Stream is because they were afraid, according to Seymour Hirsch, that uh, Germany would would backtrack, walk back the sanctions that they were putting in place because their economy was hurting from sanctioning uh, Russia. And you know, the, the, uh, the cost of living crisis in Germany and in the European Union as a whole and in the United States as well, it's, it's not so much to do with, with the actual conflict of special military operation. It has to do with the, uh, the sanctions that were put in place. I mean, that was a human decision, much like the decision to lock down during the, uh, the coup. That was a human decision. You know, a bunch of people 
sat around the table and said, let's lock down. The same thing for the, uh, for the conflict. They didn't have to sanction Russia. The EU didn't have to sanction Russia 11 times. <laughs> and all of those 11 times, it has not worked. They didn't have to do that. They could have found another way to, to deal with the conflict, maybe negotiate, maybe tell Zelensky to negotiate. Maybe they could have prevented Boris from traveling to Kiev when, uh, when they had a deal in place in March of 2022. They could have done a whole bunch of things to, to prevent the, the conflict from escalating. Maybe not send weapons, maybe not send leopards, but nope, they chose a different path. So. You know, the reason that uh, there's a cost of living crisis in Germany, my response to Annalena is, it's your fault. It's the Olaf Scholz government's fault. It's your fault. It's Habeck's fault. It's Germany's fault. The, the Merkel government, not the people, the Merkel government's fault. Because she didn't tell Poroshenko and Alensky to just honor the Minsk agreement. And Scholz could have told Alensky, just honor the Minsk agreement. And in the Munich uh, security uh, conference, right before the uh, special military operation launched, Annalena Baerbock and Olaf Scholz were at that event and they could have told Alensky to just shut up about getting nuclear weapons when he was running around Munich saying, I'm gonna get nukes, I'm gonna get nukes. Actually, he was more like, eh, I'm gonna get nukes, I'm gonna get nukes. Eh. And maybe people have a couple billion to give me as well. <laughs> That was in the early days of his home collecting. Way in the early days of his home collecting. About three weeks before the special military operation was launched, everyone was at the Munich Security Conference and all they were talking about was how Ukraine was gonna get nuclear weapons. That was the buzz of the event, Ukraine and nukes. So anyway, this, is, this has been a long, a long rambling clown world. But uh, the reason there's a cost of living crisis is because Annalena Baerbach and all the people that she's buddies with decided to sanction Russia and, decide, and decided to create a cost of living crisis. Just like they're going to create a food crisis because they just don't tell Alensky to just stop using the corridor to attack Crimea. That's all they have to do is tell him, stop using the corridor to attack Crimea. Period. End of story. If you attack Crimea via the corridor, Lensky, we're going to stop giving you money and weapons. And it's going to stop. Anyway, uh, we have one more clown world. One more clown world, and we'll wrap the video up. Let me just see how I'm doing on time here. Okay. So this will be a quick one. Janet Yellen. There are reports now saying that when Janet Yellen traveled to China, she uh, ate some psychedelic mushrooms, some magic shrooms. <laughs> and that is why when she greeted the Chinese official, she bowed three times because she was high. <laughs> this is not a joke, everyone. <laughs> this is, I'm not making this up. This is a real story with real quotes and, uh, <laughs> and real people on record saying that Janet Yellen arrived in China. She went to a restaurant. I remember when I talked about this in Larnica, I did a story on this in Larnica. She went to China first day. There was no like official state dinner. The Chinese said, just go to a restaurant and get some food. Janet Yellen and their whole team, they went to a restaurant, they got some food. The restaurant uh, owner or someone at the restaurant, whatever, they put out a tweet and they said, Janet Yellen really loves her mushrooms and they had the dishes full of mushrooms. And, uh, and that was that. And then the next day she met with a Chinese official and she bowed like three times as she greeted him. And the reason she bowed three times is because she was high, because she was at that restaurant. And the story goes is she ate magic mushrooms. Oh boy, Janet Yellen was high on shrooms. <laughs> if you buy this story, <laughs> they couldn't think of another story to put together to, to, uh, 
to excuse away her her stupidity as as she greeted the Chinese official, the embarrassing greeting that uh, that everyone saw in China. They couldn't think of a different story. They came up with magic mushrooms or psychedelic shrooms to explain it. <laughs> Does this make Janet Yellen look better or does it make her look worse? Oh, we are living in a cloud world. All right, everybody, I'm wrapping up this video. <laughs> I'm a little bit tired from the travel. So I'm going to end it right here at the Chistipudi Pond and Park. It's beautiful. Moscow, the Duran.locals.com. We are on Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, and Telegram. And go to the Duran shop. 10% off. Use the code good day. Take care.